What's up, guys? What's up? Got the wrestling mats back there. Who's ready? Anybody down or what? You want to go? Let's go. Did I tell you guys I did some wrestling a couple weeks ago? <laughs> Realize I'm 40 years old, bro. I, uh... <laughs> I went up, I, a buddy of mine, yeah, we, we, thought we, were, we thought we were all tough. And, uh, hey, bro, let's hit the mats at 5 in the morning, you know. All right. And I've been doing, like, Muay Thai for, like, a year and a half. I'm thinking, all right, I, I got this, man. You know, I got a little stomach, but whatever. Dude, and then the, and there, him and I are, were there, and then I said, I said, well, let's do, let's do three five-minute rounds. He's all, what? I go, all right. He goes, let's do three two-minute rounds. I'm all, okay, two minutes. Dude, first one minute, for, I'm th almost throwing up. I get up, <clears throat> bro, I can't breathe right now. I can't breathe right now. And I'm all panicking. He, after we were done, we did it, believe it or not. Uh, he goes to the chiropractor because he hurt his neck and his back. I, I took a nap in the middle of the day because I just messed my whole mind up. I mean, I just, I was, I was a mess, man. I'm like, Phew. doing that kind of stuff. I remember when it, you know, you see, you know, when you're younger, you do that stuff and you just don't think that it was that hard back then. But now, my gosh, man, I don't know what's going on, man. The end of days for me. <laughs> you know what I mean? But I love eating, bro. I'll tell you that right now. I, I copied this one post on Facebook. It said, I wish everything was as easy as getting fat. <laughs> Amen to that, bro. Real easy to do that. Simple. Love it. So, man, here we are. Man, we're still going. And uh, I intend on, by the end of the year, we're going to finish the book of Genesis, brothers. We are. And it's going to be a good finish, man. We're going to finish strong. But tonight, tonight, we're looking at Genesis. Do you guys even remember where we left off? Chapter 47. Anybody remember the verse? <laughs> 11, 12, somewhere around there. Yeah, I'm going to pick up at 13. And it was hard for me to remember too, bro. I, I really had to pray about it and see where we left off. Um, but looking forward to seeing what the Lord has to say to us tonight uh, in the reading Looking forward to what the Lord's doing in our lives, man. You know, individually, uh, there's so many things. I, I, I know I'm not alone. <laughs> you know, I know God is, is working in your lives, too. And, and I know that I'm not the only one going through things. You guys are going through things. And you know, I hate to say it, that brings me comfort. Seeing you suffer brings me comfort. Okay, I'm just going to say it straight up. Because I'm suffering, too. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? So it's good, man. Um, let's pray, man, and, and really give this time that God would speak to us by his spirit. And Lord, we thank you for tonight. And Lord, what we can do on the human side of things is pray for your intervention. Our minds, Lord, they drift. They're, we're tired. We're distracted. It's just how we're made. Um, but Lord, we believe that you're greater than these things. Uh, you, you are victorious. Your spirit is more powerful. So we pray, Lord, that you would use the natural things that are in our lives to bring about the supernatural and that we would hear from you tonight, Lord, concerning your will for our lives and just encouragement, just some direction, Lord, on, on being a believer and having faith in you in these days. So we plead and cry out to you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Genesis chapter 47, verse 13, is where we left off. We've been in our journey of looking at Joseph and the time that he is here. You know, I did some side investigating uh, about Joseph being recorded in Egypt. Have, have any of you guys ever done that sort of research? Just maybe seeing what archaeologists or history might say about Joseph's existence in Egypt. Because the Egyptians were very documented. They documented everything. Um, and so I figured, well, we would find something, right, that relates to Joseph. And it was interesting because um, you really don't. Uh, but the information that you... There's, there's one piece of information that I found interesting. And it was uh, during the 12th dynasty of the pharaohs and there was a tomb 
uh, that was created for somebody, the, obviously through the hieroglyphics and the statues and everything they found. And the statue that was broken in pieces, it was like a life-size statue, you know, they made him big or whatever, had this uh, image of somebody that wasn't looking like the Egyptians, you know, the hair thing. I guess the Egyptians, the way they did their burial tombs were real specific, and some of you might have seen pictures of that. But this one identified as if it was a foreigner or a stranger, you know. And the place and position that was the hieroglyphics led to explaining was he was in a prominent position in that 12th dynasty era and that he was possibly a vizier like we know Joseph was. Name wasn't Joseph. That's the thing. They don't find that name, that Egyptian name that we're given in the Bible. But I thought it was interesting that there's just one little piece of evidence that explains that during this time, this setting, historically, there is, there was artifacts that point to someone that had a position of power that was not of an Egyptian descendant, but yet that, that existed. And that was during a very productive time of the Pharaoh, because that's what we're going to see tonight. We're going to see, because because when you read about what we see Joseph doing, man, he did some big things now. Like, that would have to go, that, that could not, I'm sorry, go unnoticed, the things that he did, especially with the people like the Egyptians, who recorded everything they did. And so, kind of interesting, that if you look far enough into the history, there's some evidence that points towards an existence of somebody like Joseph. But again, you know, you don't have the names and you don't have all those things that match up. But, you know, this is a long time ago what we're talking about here. And, of course, uh, there's the other side to it, that the enemy is going to do everything he possibly can to cover up things like this from ever coming to, you know, as proof or evidence that there's biblical um, coexistence with archaeology today. So let's start at verse 13. I just want to kind of share that. And it says now in verse 13 that there was no bread in all the land for the famine was very sore, so that the land of Egypt and all the land of Canaan fainted by reason of the famine. This is our intro to our reading tonight. I want to highlight this verse for a moment. This explains what the famine has caused. It explains sort of the, the overall fruit of what's taking place. The famine, in other words, drained everything here. That's what a famine does. A famine is sent, and its purpose is to eliminate something. Exhaust of all resources. And here, the famine has finally reached a point where all the land of Egypt and all the land of Canaan is fainting because of this famine. Now, I've mentioned this before, because you have to go there when you start talking about this famine, especially particularly this one and how we're going to read this story tonight. We know that God is the one who allows for famines to happen. We know that. We believe that. And we also then have to believe that God is the one who allows famines to happen in each and every one of our lives too. And the famine, when God allows a famine to happen in each and every one of our lives, it does exactly what we see this famine doing here. It drains us of everything we are. We can actually say that we become faint because of, let's say, the famine or the trial or the situation that God has allowed to come in our life. We become faint too. That's the relationship we see here between this famine of Egypt and the famine that takes place in all of our lives as well. We have to be comforted to some degree that knowing God is the one who allows for the famine to take place. It's hard to be comforted in that, but it does bring some comfort, knowing that somebody is in control, and the person who is in control, the desire that God has for this famine, is that it would exhaust everything about you. Is your trial, is your situation, is the, is the circumstance is exhausting everything about who you are? That God sent famine. In Matthew 10, 39, it says, He that finds his life shall lose it, and he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. Now, who of us in this room want to lose our life? You know, and, and, and we might say openly, Yeah, man, I want to lose my life for Jesus' sake. I want to lose my life 
for the sake of the glory of the Lord. Well, let, what if we rephrase that a little bit? How many of you in here want to die? Okay. Let's say, how many of us want to lose everything that's comfortable? How many of us in here want to lose everything that's reasonable as men, as humans on this planet? None of us are going to jump to say, I'm ready, man. I want to lose everything about me. Because honestly, the loss of who we are, the death of who we are, is not comfortable at all. It's not something exciting. It's not something that's going to make us full of joy. Especially for those of us, and those, we might know someone who's gone through trial and tribulation. There really isn't anything too exciting about it. It isn't something that we would just give each other high five about. Man, I'm dying right now. My life is just ruined. I love it. All the relationships, Simon, are just dying too. It's so great. But he says, in order for us to find life, we have to lose it. We do. It's a, it's a necessary part of being discovered. See, it's a, ne a necessary part of, of life, spiritual life. We have to lose it, our life. God will bring a famine and a trial, and a circumstance in your life that you would die, spiritually speaking, that your flesh would die. So that way, his life can be brought about in you and in me. And so these, these things are, are meant to happen. This is going to happen, and if it hasn't happened in your life yet, every one of us in this room are going to experience something that comes in our life that causes this to die, to hurt to suffer, to faint. All of us in this room are going to go through it. Not because God get, gets kicks out of it, but because we have to go through the dying process in order to discover spiritual life. We have to. In order to experience revival, the flesh has to die. It's a bummer, man. I know it. I'm going through it too, with you guys. <laughs> but... It doesn't end at the death, you see. It brings life. That's the way he does it. That's the way God said it when he predestinated how this world would be and how effective, uh, how communication from the heavens to the earths would be. He said, suffering and hurt is going to be my effective tool on, those, on that flesh of theirs. I'm sorry. Like the verse in Ecclesiastes 7.3. Uh, uh, sorrow is greater than laughter because sorrow changes the countenance of the heart and for those of us in this room who have experienced sorrow you know your heart changed it changed and you wish you didn't have to go through that but when you look back at it you say it did I will never look at this the same way I will never look at that the same way again I will, and, and you change because it, it, the grief Spiritual famines are a blessing from the Lord because it's how he draws us close to him and how he makes us want to draw ourselves away from the world. <laughs> Verse 14. So now Joseph gathered up all the money that was found in the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan for the corn which they bought, and Joseph brought the money into Pharaoh's house. And when money failed, circle that, in the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan, all the Egyptians came unto Joseph and said, Give us bread, for why should we die in thy presence? For the money fails. Well, interesting. Proverbs 11.28 tells us, that he that trusts in riches shall fall. You see, money is what we use these days for provision. It is. Let's, let's just go there. Uh, it, it's what we have to have. It's the way our, our currency, that's the way it's set up. It's the way our government is ran. Money is necessary, you know. Let's just go there. But what happens with riches and money especially in the Egyptian culture back then, <laughs> is money is a symbol of, of prestige, you know. How much you got, and it still is today. 
you know, I got a house in Havasu, I got a house in it, I got a boat, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, you, you know, money is kind of those things that we have. A lot of us are identified by that, you know. And that's, that's just the way it is. No, no way around it. But money is essential for these types of provisions. But we also know that money and riches don't bring true peace and true love and joy and true fulfillment i i always i always unfortunately i, I trip out on these documentaries like with uh, i watch about robin williams or you know you watch these certain ones of these people who had money i mean of course somebody might say well they got everything in the world they need and it's sad to see how lonely these people are and depressed and just full of dread and you know and it's really messed up man it's really a messed up thing but it's just more and more evidence and proof that money doesn't bring what I think for face value what we think it does. We all know. All of us in this room know that. That money doesn't do that. But notice for the Egyptian people here that money's the first thing to go. It's the first thing to fail them. It's the first thing that they, they're like, hey, the money ain't doing anything anymore. And that's, that's interesting because the 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 fact that the money failed them was the first thing the famine had to show them. To show them that if you trust in these types of things, then ultimately the result is death because these types of things don't sustain you. Money can't sustain you in this way. It's not meant to. It's a man-created thing. And so here they are telling him, give us bread for why should we die? Because our money's failing us. You know, we got to be real careful in these days today. Not to put our own, you know, ba eggs in that basket. Especially as believers. The world does it all the time. And when I say the world, you know, there's, there, that's the, sometimes the, the drive behind some people's agenda in their day is money, man. That's it. I'm out to make money. Blah, 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 end of story, that's my deal. I'm a businessman, you know. And we got to be careful as believers to not fall under the trap of saying money is then every, all I need. Because when God brings that trial, a lot of the times you could talk to a believer who was successful or maybe they still are. A lot of them lost it <laughs> at one point. And God revealed it to them. And you'll talk to a believer who is successful today and they'll tell you, well, money isn't everything. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? And, and, uh, and then you could talk to somebody who had it all. And a part of their testimony is, oh, I was well off, man, and all this and that. And then God, you know, did this and that in my life. And now and then I, didn't, I lost it all. I lost it all. Because these types of things that we say are, let's say, important for provisions, if they stand above God, then God has to reveal to you that they're not important for provision. That God, God will say, oh, you... I told you already, I will have no other idols before me in your life. And I will not let money be an idol to the believer. For the Christian, unfortunately, money cannot be your provider. And he will show that to you. Some of you have that testimony. I know some of you in here who have gone through that. And it's incredible. Because you, 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 you walk away, man, stronger than ever. Knowing, gosh, man, my eyes were set in the wrong place. Some of you in here are going, oh, I can't wait for that trial, man. Give it to me, Lord. Let me have all the money first, you know? <laughs> it's, like, it's like when you hear Jeff or one of the pastors talking about, you know, the lotto hitting the lotto and everything. You're kind of like, well, I want to try first. You know, let me try it. I want to go through that trial. No, I don't think we do. <laughs> I'll, I'll take it from them, you know, those that, that got all weird. But here he's showing them right off the top what they defined as sustenance that gave them life. It's failing. First thing to go. You know, uh, and that's, I always tell my kids about, I always draw out the apocalypse time, you know, and I make it all dramatic and, you know, walking around and the sun's not really out and it's foggy everywhere and they're killing rabbits with, like, have you ever seen that, that movie, The Book of Eli? That's kind of how I draw out the apocalypse for my kids, you know? I, I, I make it hardcore, you know? Got to walk around with knives and everything. And, you know, but what's most important isn't money anymore. It's, you know, I'll trade you that, you know? that lighter, you know, that's worth everything, you know, that's kind of, and that's kind of what we're going to see happen, as money will always fail, because ultimately, guys, it's only paper, 
Right now, it's a little more vapor, but one day, it'll only be used to fuel some fire, you know. Joseph said, okay, you're out of money. Got it. Give me your cattle, and I will give you for your cattle. If money fails, I'll, I'll give it to you for your cattle. And they brought their cattle unto Joseph, and Joseph gave them bread in exchange for horses and for the flocks and for the cattle of the herds and for their donkeys. And he fed them with bread for their cattle for that year. Now, this is getting real interesting here. Because now they've given them money. That's failing. That means nothing anymore. And so now he's saying, okay, what do you got? What do you own? Tell me about your cattle. Now, for them, cattle and horses and all that stuff meant something entirely different than it does to us. Horses today are like, the, you wear a little hat and you ride it and do little tricks on it. For them, military prestige. Horses meant a whole status of life. Entirely different thing for them. I love that scripture in Psalms chapter 20. And it's in verse 7. It says, some trust in chariots, some in horses, but we will remember the name of our Lord, our God. Now, is it, is it wrong to trust in, in chariots? Well, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it's wrong to depend on your own self, on your own resources, on the things that you might find to protect yourself. Psalms 20, verse 7. Now, again, chariots, horses are all military things for them at that time. And the Egyptians were, were prided themselves in their military efforts. Remember, Pharaoh races out in his chariot, you know, to go chase after the Israelites when he releases them. It's something they all did. And so if you had this in your own personal life, hey, you were up there. You were ready to get down for battle. It's like the guy who owns all kinds of guns, you know. I'm ready, man. Well, you know, some trust in ARs, some trust in nines. Don't, but I trust in the Lord. And see, for them, here we now see God's just working from the top, and he started to get into their lives now. He's working, he's working one aspect at a time. And he's saying, this famine's going to do a whole lot here. It's going to take away money. I'm going to then also watch you surrender your cattle and your horses and everything you have. But tell me something, guys. Is this not what God wants for all of our lives too? To eventually use a trial or use something in our lives where we are going to start just saying, here's this. Here's that. Here's this, Lord. I, here's... I trusted in that. I put faith in this. I put faith in that. And all of a sudden, you're going to find that the trial or the famine is causing you really just to relinquish everything you are to the Lord and everything you have, even right down to your intellect, even right down to your, your manhood, you know? You just start surrendering everything. We need to look at this famine and learn. Lord, what else do I have to give over to you? What else do I have to surrender? What else am I holding on to so tight that I believe is a part of me, you know, and that you want? See, Joseph is, is portraying this type of Jesus here. Really, he is. By saying, all right, got your money. Now give me everything else that you might have. And I, in return, will give you something to live for. I'll give you something that's going to be life-sustaining. We can't be caught off guard or surprised when God begins to ask for your horses too and your money and your cattle. All those things that we might find protection in. That's a big one because security is what a lot of us want. We all crave some kind of security for the future. I don't care who you are. We all want to know I'm going to be okay when, you know, 20 years from now. And so we all make attempts to kind of build ourselves somewhat of a foundation for that. And that's okay. We're supposed to be wise about what we do and wise about our future and retiring and all. We're supposed to be that way. If we have a family, you want to be wise about that. But you can't make it everything you are and you can't make it all you're living for and, and, and you can't put all your trust in it because gosh, imagine if the banking system shut down. Where would we all be then? Imagine if, if all of what we invest in, in, in mutual funds or, or, or if some of you ballers, hedge funds and, you know, these types of things. What happens when all that fails? Oh, man, what, what, what happened to my future now? You know, what, what am I going to do? And all of a sudden, somewhere in the back of your mind is, well, I guess maybe I just have to trust in the Lord now. 
I have to give all that up to him too. And here they are giving up everything just for some food to, to sustain their family's life. They're giving up everything that one point in time held very dear, very tight to. Interesting what the famine does, isn't it? Now watch this. It gets crazier. Verse 18. And when that year was ended, as if that was a good year, they came unto him the second year and said, We will not hide it from my Lord, how that our money is spent. My Lord also has our herds and cattle, and there's not aught left in the sight of my Lord but our own bodies and our lands now. God, what else do you want? What else can we give to you that's going to help us live here? Now, now we, all we have is our own bodies. Look at wherefore, verse 19, shall we die before thy eyes? Both we and our land, buy us and our land for bread. And we and our land will be servants unto Pharaoh. Give us seed that we may live and not die, that the land be not desolate. Verse 20, and Joseph, look at, okay. He bought all the land of the Egypt for Pharaoh, for the Egyptians sowed every man his field, because the famine prevailed over them. God allowed this to continue to go on until there was more, nothing else to give. Look at, so the land became Pharaoh's, verse 21, and as for the people, he removed them to cities from one of the, of the borders of Egypt, even to the other end. Look at this. The reality here is that death is equaling life for them. The death of everything they are, even down to their bodies. I mean, they're like, they're like, we have nothing else. I, I can't help, though, to not look at that and say, gosh, I want to get there. <laughs> Isn't that weird? I want to get to this point where whatever God's doing in my life, I finally look to him and just say, I have nothing else. I have nothing else to give anymore. I have nothing else that I'm holding on to to trust in. All I have now is my body, my land. That's, how they, that's who they were. That's all they had, our lands. Is now, 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 now we have nothing. Now, now we're not identified as nothing. They were identified by their lands and by their property. That's how the, the Egyptians identified. They're actually, a lot of ancient culture were identified by their. their remember Abraham and, and and Lot. You go that way. You go that way. You take that. The land was a big deal. It was who they are. It was how they sustain their families. And then, you know, these people back then had all their families living on the land. But now they're giving up everything. It meant to give up even their security of their family. And the future of their family. They're not even concerned at this point about preserving the future within their own strength. They're like, give it to Pharaoh then. I don't care. Take it all. But isn't that what the Lord wants from every one of us? Isn't he saying that now? I want everything from you. Yes, everything you, you might find that's, that's in your hands to provide and you're the guy, I know you're the provider, and I know it's important for you to have a, a job or have a, have a plan and all these things. I know that, but listen, I want you to give it all to me. And, and if you are in a place right now where the circumstance and the trial is, is draining you and you're feeling very over the weight of it, well, then guess what? You're in a good place. I hate to tell you that. Because what's happening then is you're finally just going, I can't, I can't, I can't do this anymore. And then you end up finding out, man, that it was never meant for you to do anyway. You, you, you finally find out that, what have I been doing this whole time? How, how, how have I been thinking that it's been my responsibility to live out this Christian life? What made me start thinking that it was in my control to have victory? See, the victory comes from Christ, not from us. The, the, the peace of mind, the life, doesn't come from us. It comes from Jesus. It comes from God the Father. It comes from the Holy Spirit. It doesn't come from us. And so here we are living our lives thinking we have some peace in this. And the Lord's all the while saying, no, 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 no. You don't. I, I remember a long time, I shared a long time ago, uh, the Lord doesn't want your fingerprints on the work that he's doing in your life. They're, they're dirty. He's got to clean it up. 
Galatians 2.20. We know that scripture. I no longer live anymore, but Christ lives in me. Yeah, I was crucified with Christ Jesus. I no longer live anymore, but he lives in me now. How many of us can say that today? I don't live anymore. I, I've given it all up. And yeah, it's, a, it's still a battle. It's, it's like a habit. It takes a while, you know, to finally just go away, man. It takes a while. The urges are still there. The, the desire to control is still there. The need to feel like we got to do because that's how we're wired as men. That's still there. But I've come to this realization that when I feel that desire, sense that urge to get my hands back on my life, I know now to say, stop, that's enough. I give that to the Lord right now. Yeah, I don't want to get back in, in the wheel there. He has to be the driver. I'm done being in that front row. In fact, put me in the trunk. I don't even want to be in the back seat either because I'll start wanting to turn and start back seat driving with the Lord. Don't want to do that either. But look what happens now. Now they're at a point where just they've given their whole lives, man. <laughs> now look at verse 22. Only the land of the priest bought he not, for the priest had a portion assigned them of Pharaoh, and did eat their portion which Pharaoh gave them, wherefore they stole not their lands. Kind of self-explanatory. The, then Joseph said unto the people, Behold, I have bought you this day, and your land for Pharaoh. Lo, here is seed for you, and you shall sow the land. And it shall come to pass in the increase, you know, whatever comes from the seed, that ye shall give the fifth part unto Pharaoh. Look how smart he was, huh? There, here comes taxes. And, and four parts shall be your own for seed of the field and for your food and for them of your household and for food for your little ones. So you'll get to take care of all your family. And then they said, thou hast saved our lives. How many of you guys, when you're filing your taxes, send a letter to the IRS and you've saved my life? Oh, the IRS, you have saved our lives. <laughs> so they're telling them, you have saved our lives, you know. And let us find grace in the sight of my Lord, and we will be Pharaoh's servants. And Joseph made it a law over the land of Egypt unto this day, that Pharaoh should have a fifth part, except the land of the priest, only which became not Pharaoh's. Now this is interesting. I know we, we see the, the economic thing happening here, right? It's pretty obvious. But look past that for a moment with me. 2 Corinthians 4.12 says, Second Corinthians 4.12 says, So then death worketh in us, but life in you. What is that saying? See, the death that's happening here in their lives, the death that's happening in our lives is for a reason, okay? It's for a purpose. It doesn't just stop there. It doesn't just stop at the story here of them giving taxes, you know. The, this is a picture to me of after all of this stuff is exhausted in our lives. To me, this is a picture now of us saying and of God saying, really, now a portion of your life I want you to use for my glory. I want you to give it back. The death of our lives is for us, but life, as the scripture said, for them. Paul understood that. Paul figured it out. He said, well, then I die, but I die not, not just for my own benefit, not for my own breaking and for my own being drawn close to the Lord. I die also, though, that I can bring life to others, that the life that I'm going through here and I'm all this stuff isn't just for naught. It's now that God would say, okay, I've brought you to a place of, of humility. You're a humble person. I, 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 you have... You have given your all you have surrendered all who you are but it doesn't stop there now i want to use you i want you know not necessarily in the in the fourth to the fifth part or whatever but the idea is the same i want to use you now i want to bring life to someone else through your death through the things that you're giving up the things that you're going through the things that i'm doing in your life and you're and you're just taking it all i want you to know i now want to use you that somebody else might see the life through it because guess what someone else is going through it too someone else is experiencing it and they don't know what's happening they don't know what's going on and the Lord's saying but I but I took you through it and now I want you to be a, an, an available open vessel 
that I can go and minister through you to someone else. This is the body ministry. This is how it works. Because guys, the, the body of Christ is so overwhelmingly intricate. There's people getting saved today. There's somebody at their 20-year mark. There's someone at their five-year mark. There's so, you know, and, and everything is different in the body. But God wants to use the body to like our body that fixes itself when we're sick, <laughs> that helps you know, to bring uh, uh, strength in one area that's weak. That's the way the body works. And so all of us in here tonight, we're not just sitting here just because, you know, yeah, I'm going through it or whatever, and yeah, I'm receiving from the word. No, our next thing should be, Lord, then how do you want to use this? Lord, because how, how, how then, Lord, I give it to you, and then I'll, I'll, I just, I'll depend and wait on you, Lord, that you would bring glory to yourself through what's happening in my life. And that's a God thing. You can just leave that on the Lord. You don't have to make, you don't have to figure out how it's going to happen. You just have to make yourself available and say, okay, Lord, I don't know how it's going to happen, but Lord, here I am. And, and use this. I give it to you. And so this whole picture of what we sing, starting off again from the famine, from the trial. It's such, a, it's such an amazing work that God does and that he has planned for every one of us. And through the giving and through the exhausting of who we are. So don't fight it. That's, that's, that's the thing. Don't, don't try to hold tight to what you feel God stripping from your hands. Don't fight it. It's for a reason. There's a purpose behind it. Now, verse 27. And Israel dwelt in the land of Egypt, in the country of Goshen. And they had possessions therein, and they grew and they multiplied exceedingly. Why? Because fruit comes from these, the famine. See, isn't that something? They're, they're, they multiplied exceedingly. I'm, I'm always having to remind myself of the goodness of the Lord, not just the, the harshness of the Lord. I, I love reading and studying the Old Testament, so obviously I'm always envisioning the gloom and doom God, right? But I got to get myself out of that at times and read the New Testament and realize that he's a loving God and a friend to the believer. That's what he said. I no longer call you servant, but I call you friends. So God loves us. And so, so the hurt and the pain and the trial and the, and the difficulties, that what's produced from that is joy, but a, a truthful joy for those, as the scripture says, who are exercised thereby. It produces a peaceable fruit of righteousness because he loves us. And look at, he, he multiplied them exceedingly. In verse 20, it says, And Jacob lived in the land of Egypt 17 years. So the whole age of Jacob was 140 and seven years. Wow, man. Dennis, how'd that feel? No, yeah, just... <laughs> Imagine that, though, 147 years old. Can you believe that? I, I, I would be, Lord, I'm done, man. I, 140, I've been, you know, done. Jeez, that means I'm 40. I mean, 100 more years of this? <laughs> no, thank you. And Jacob, so, and the time drew nigh that Israel must die. That rhymed. And he called his son Joseph, and he said unto him, Look, if now I have found grace in thy sight, and this is interesting, put, I pray thee, thy hand under my thigh, and deal kindly and truly with me. Bury me not, I pray thee, in Egypt. Look at, look at the burden here. Whenever, they, whenever you see the Bible, they're, they're doing this. Put your hand on my thigh. It's like this urgent, it's, it's just sort of re really sentimental, serious conversation. It's, it's meant to be looked at that way. This is a, make a promise, man. Make a, make a bond to me right now, man. That you're not going to leave me here in Egypt. That, that my life doesn't end here. You know, well, let me read it. Verse 30. But I will lie with my fathers and thou shalt carry me out of Egypt. Bury me in the burying place. And he said, I will do as thou hast said. And he said, swear unto me. And he swear unto him. And Israel bowed himself upon the bed's head. He died. He's gone. But he makes it a point to say here, my heart is not here, man. My heart is elsewhere. Don't bury me here. This is not where I'm supposed to be. This is not my life. I am not going to end it here. See, I really like that. Because at the end of the day, guys, after everything God has done in our lives, after everything he did in, in Jacob's life, 
from all the different, the, the, whole, the whole slew of scenarios that we've read in his life. It landed him here in Egypt. God did a tremendous work in his life. Revolution, his, revolutionized his whole, can you imagine it? You know, when he saw his son alive. But at the end of the day, there's this realization behind the work that God does in our life, in our lives that says, my heart is not here. So yes, God is working. Yes, the famine transforms. Yes, I surrender my life. Yes, my life for Christ and Christ lives in me. Yes, I want God to use me for others. But at the end of the day, you know what? Our heart is not here. This is not where it ends. You see, our lives and the ministry and, 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 and how we allow the Lord to use us and move in our lives, it, it doesn't end here. And that's, that's the hope that we have. That, you know, after it's all said and done, as much as the, the burden of, of sometimes the moving hand of God in our lives can feel like, because it sometimes can feel burdensome, our heart's not here. See, that's why, that's why we're able to be used this way. Because we become, ex, is, what's the word, expendable? Is that what I'm trying to say? We, we become, you know, no. It's, it's not about me. It's not about this life even. My heart's not here. My, uh, when this is all said and done and it's all over, I'm going to be spending eternity with the Lord and my loved ones who have gone before me. That's what this life, that's, that's the end game. The end result is to spend eternity with the Lord and in his presence forever. And so all of what we see happening here, I like how Jacob's like, look, man, promise me this. Don't leave me here. Not in Egypt. This is not where it ends. <laughs> it doesn't end here. And, and I, and I want to I take that as, a, as an encouragement because, guys, this life is going to be full of this trial. Because our, our, our flesh is so living. And, and that's a bummer. And some of us, our flesh is more living than others. <laughs> you know, And it's going to take a lifetime to continue to get us to surrender everything of who we are. That God can use us. But be encouraged. It doesn't end here. We don't reach this ultimate state of, I did it finally. I'm there. I'm at the ultimate state of humility now. <laughs> There's no more trial that can take any more of me. I've exhausted all of my flesh to God. That's not going to happen. I'm sorry. If you think that's you right now, then trial awaits you tomorrow. Because you're going to see again, there's something else in you. This flesh cannot be perfected here on earth. It can't until it's over and we're in the presence of the Lord. And so we have to say, Lord, then, then it's not like a trick that, okay, man, get this trial over with so that way I'm good. It doesn't work that way. It's, Lord, then just continue that slow work in my life to cause me to just become this empty vessel that, that I can be used by the Lord. And, you know, one day, whenever that time is, I'm going to be home with the Lord for eternity. And, and my loved ones, my family, and, 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 and with, the, with the body of believers, and so Jacob ends his life at a good age, at a good age, and, and with, with a, a lot of trial, but with a lot, of, a lot of transition and change for the good. Amen? Let's pray. So Father, we thank you, Lord, for this word tonight, and Lord, for the reality of, of seeing uh, how you move in our lives. How you, how you do desire for us to surrender everything. And, and, it, and it's, thank you for the, the word that tells us it's not, it's, we're not going to reach perfection here and a place of, you know, ultimate spirituality um, because it's an ongoing work. And as much, Lord, as the work uh, can hurt us and as much as it becomes sometimes painful and confusing sometimes, uh, Lord, show your goodness because you love us. Show your goodness to us, Lord, uh, through the strength you might give us, Lord, to get through it. Uh, the ability to smile when there's no reason to. The ability to love someone else when there's nothing but hatred all around. Um, the ability to go through a loss and but yet still have joy. Continue that work, Lord, that we would be people that... 
are sending that message off of the work that you do to transform lives and that someone else might receive life through that so we thank you lord and pray for that empowering touch miraculous touch of your spirit tonight in jesus name amen god bless you guys